Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. And uh, we're going to be taking our, I wouldn't say take our reading from here, we're going to read some verses from this. I'm going to mainly tell you the story, but we will direct our attention to some verses in the story. Uh, Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. I want to start off by um, putting this on the board, a little graphic for you, and talking about the significance of what happened uh, at the cross of Jesus. I really like what Trevor said this morning when he was waiting on the table. He was talking about how the Old Testament Israelites, they looked forward to Jesus in faith. They never did see Him. And we look back to Jesus in faith. We haven't ever seen Him. We haven't smelled Him or touched Him. Um, it doesn't matter what side of the cross that we live on, uh, we live by faith, if we're justified by faith in this. The diff- there was something very special that happened here, obviously, besides Jesus dying on the cross and um, securing salvation for the faithful. What happened there is there was a change in covenants. And many of you perhaps are familiar with this concept, but some of you maybe not as much. It's very uncommon for me to meet somebody uh, a stranger, and we have a little maybe just coincidental Bible study, or we're just talking about the Bible, and people get this idea that at the cross there was something very major that happened. There was a we talked about it last time that I spoke from Hebrews, Hebrews 12, and if you go to Hebrews 12 and read verses 18 through 29, the Bible talks about how the covenant that the people of God lived under over here ended and was replaced by a better superior covenant in Christ. You can read about that also in Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 7 through 13. There it's very obvious. And in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, it talks about how the handwriting of requirements, a reference to the law of Moses, was nailed to the cross. And at that point in time, there was a change in the will of God, you might say. I mean, it's not like God didn't intend for this to happen from the beginning, but God's law changed. And so what people... What people did uh, in worship changed. How they worshiped God changed, not just to their own whim, but God's law on worship changed. God's law on certain aspects of daily living changed. You didn't have to sit outside of the camp for seven days uh, if you were a woman, certain time of the year. Uh, You didn't have to sit outside the camp for certain days and not worship if you were a person who had touched a dead carcass. We don't have to do that anymore. You didn't, ha- you didn't get stoned if you didn't keep the Sabbath anymore. All that was the old law. That was the old covenant. But that changed at Sinai. Now, this may seem peculiar to you why I'm bringing all this up in Numbers chapter 13. But we're going to come back to this in our application. As uh, this study is really a study about discerning the will of God. And when we're talking about discerning the will of God, you could just phrase that discerning the word of God or, or the law of God. And ultimately, that comes down to the fact that today... The word for God's people, the law for God's people, God's will for his people is different than it was at other times. And so this is really a study to help us understand what is the will of God for our lives today. Now in Numbers chapter 13, um, I think Nathan talked on this a while back. I listened to some of your talk again as I was preparing for this. And he did a fine job in our Old Testament survey talking about the event at Kadesh Barnea. That was the name of the event, and I'm probably butchering that. It probably had a lot different pronunciation in the Hebrew. But at Kadesh Barnea, the people of Israel had left Egypt. They had been in the wilderness that was between the land of Canaan, uh, we'll say geographically north of Egypt. And they had been in this wilderness space for about two years. About a year of that had been spent at Mount Sinai where Moses received the law and was given the covenant and the people entered into covenant with God where he shook the mountain. That's what I talked about last time. And so after they do that, God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to give you a land, the land of Canaan, and you're going to become a great people. Well, they've become a great people, and they have traveled through the wilderness for two years, and they're finally camped right outside of Canaan at Kadesh Barnea. And they can see the land, but they can't enter it because that land is populated by the Anakim, giants, the Bible says. Um, the Bible says, I was looking up the other day, if you want to get standards of measurement in common English, 
uh, the Christian Standard Bible is the translation to go to it, and it just tells you, uh, it doesn't say that J G Goliath was 10 cubits, it just says he was 9 foot 9 inches. And I suppose that he was somehow related to the Anakim in the land of Canaan here. And so these people are huge. I mean, nine, about as tall as from the floor to the ceiling. That's probably a 10 foot ceiling, I'm guessing. Pretty tall folks. And um, these Israelites, they're about one and a half million to two million people in number, but they're slaves. They're not like men of war. And they fought a couple of battles. Um, but again, they're not really men of war. The only strength they really have on their side is the God of Israel. And so anyways, God tells the children of Israel at the beginning of this chapter, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 here. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. Well, there were 12 tribes of Israel. Um, you can learn about those leading up to the book of Numbers 13. Um, there was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim and um, Naphtali and Levi. There's 12 tribes, and each one of them is supposed to take their leader. So you can just imagine, for point of reference, it would be like, who would be patriarchal heads kind of in this congregation? Maybe it would be Ed, would be one of these guys. I don't know that I would want to send Ed into battle uh, to represent me, but he, he would be, again, these were not really warrior people. It would obviously be a miracle that we won if we send Ed into battle. <laughs> But that's what it was like. Uh, you might have Bobby would represent one of the tribes, and maybe Mark and Danny. But you get the idea. They're a patriarchal head, um, and they were told to go into the land as spies, and they would spy out the land and bring back a report to the people of God, these one and a half million people that are camped. And so they do that. And, and these guys go out, and they, in fact, part of the story is they take this long branch essentially of grapes and they bring it back and they show man the produce here is amazing and uh, this is everything that God told us it was going to be is until they get to talking about the population and the people that dwell in that land are giants and uh, just scared the wits out of them last time I uh, spoke I talked about how sometimes we use the phrase, I peed my pants. And I'm sure that that happened. They were so scared of these giants in the land. And so they were really happy and really satisfied with the land quality, but they really didn't have any faith that God could deliver them. And there was only two people that came back of those 12 spies that had any faith in God to deliver this land to them. And it was Caleb and Joshua. And I thought about today, I've never... Did they use nicknames back there, Caleb and Josh? Caleb and Josh came back and said that um, we can do this, guys. We can overtake these giants. These giants aren't any better. They're not any bigger and badder than the land of Egypt. They have been delivered by God from the most powerful ruler in all the world and the largest empire, and they're worried about some giants in the land of Canaan. That's essentially the case. And only two of these guys come back with a faithful report. This is what Caleb and Joshua said in verses 6 through 10 of Numbers chapter 14. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he'll bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread." Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. And all the congregation said to, this, to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. They were not effective preachers, apparently. But a spoiler alert, they don't get stoned with stones. But that's how um, rebellious and faithless the people were because you had 10 guys who were yelling over the two faithful spies. And of course, as we oftentimes see in, in common day-to-day -day affairs, the majority typically sways the vote. <laughs> and people tend to go uh, with the majority regardless of the truth of the message. But anyways, 
They weren't stoned, and Moses mediates with, the pe- with God for the people. And he, he prays to God, he says, God, because God wants to completely destroy this people. And he wants to make a, a nation just out of Moses. He says, I'm done with this people. He even says that he has been patient with them these ten times that they have tested him in the wilderness. And if you try to do the math and you go back and read up to Numbers 13, what are these ten times that these people have tried God specifically that he has reference to? Um, one of them would be when they complained about the manna in the wilderness. That would obviously be one of them. One of them would be when they complained about not having enough water before that. But specifically, I can't tell you precisely what they were. But needless to say, God had been tested by them 10 different times. And for anybody that says that the God of the Old Testament is a capricious bully who just wants to throw his weight around... um, This is a good example that he has been very, very patient with them. And so uh, Moses mediates with God to not destroy this people. And God decides, okay, I'm not going to destroy this people. In verse 39, the Bible says this, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel. When it says he told these words to them, he, he told them all the words that he had had conversation with God about. And based off of that conversation, the people are woken up. The people mourn greatly. They rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain saying, Here we are, and we'll go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we've sinned. And so, um, these people finally get the wake-up call. Moses is the most influential man in all of the, the, the nation of Israel. And so they finally believe it. They finally believe it. I'm sure when that cloud came over the tabernacle, that put the fear in them again, just like it did at Sinai. And they listened to Moses. But regardless, they, the Bible says that they mourned and they said, we'll do what we were supposed to do in the first place. Now, one thing that we can take note from this, and we're going to learn several lessons this evening, is that just because you repent, and it seems like here that these people really did repent, like they, were, they had godly sorrow in the sense that they were very sorry and they wanted to do what was right. I don't doubt for a second that they didn't. But what we're going to find out is that God didn't, he didn't want them to go and take the land after this all happened. They didn't take it. They repented, but God had had enough. And he's like, no, you're not going to conquer Canaan anymore, at least not by my power. And so just because you're forgiven of something by God even, doesn't mean that there's not consequences that you have to live out. And for these people, the entire nation, the, the, the generation that had no faith and would not enter Canaan, they would bear the consequence of never entering the land. And so that's something simple that we can take away, is you can be forgiven, but that doesn't remove the consequences of your actions. And that's just something that's practical in our own circumstances whenever we, we come across things that we've done And we might pray to God and ask for forgiveness, but God doesn't take away the consequences that we might live out for what we've done. Well, that's just kind of a side note. But the point that I want to draw from this is that these people really did repent. And I I really do believe that that was the case. Now, the problem with this whole situation, if there was a problem, you could say, I believe the problem was that these people didn't understand that God, His will can change. And in this story from Numbers chapter 13 to the very end of the story at Numbers chapter 14, at the very beginning of it, God tells them to conquer the land of Canaan. But by the end of it, he tells them, do not conquer the land of Canaan. And of course, God's will in that thing changed overnight even. These people woke up one morning, God tells them to do one thing, they go to bed, and the next morning he tells them not to do that thing. Now, that's not to say that God's just He's changing his mind all the time, and you just can't ever... De- what, man, what does he want today? You know, That's not what we're supposed to get out of this. But the idea is that God's will can change. The good thing is that when God's will does change, he reveals it to his people. And he did so in this occasion. He told them very clearly in verse 40, I believe it was, of Numbers chapter 14. Let me find it here. Um, verse 41. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For they, this will not succeed. That's God telling the people through Moses, don't do this. They want to make things right and do what they were supposed to do, but he tells them, don't do this. God has changed his mind. So it's not as if God changes his mind, he doesn't tell you about it. Now, in verse 45, 
the Bible says this. They go ahead and they do what? They, they try to enter and conquer Canaan anyway. And the Bible says in verse 45, Then the Amalekites, the Canaanites, who dwelt in the mountain, came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. So they basically said, Surely God would be pleased with this. Surely God would be pleased if we uh, did this thing to, in His name and His honor and His glory. And you see this a lot of times in society. You see people that do things in the name of God, but if you were to pick up your Bible and to read the Word of God and the will of God, it's not the will of God. And yet people do all the th things a lot, a lot of time in, in, in churches or just out in all day-to-day -day activities, and they'll, they'll do it in the name of God. But it goes completely against God's Word. Doing it in the name of God doesn't make it right. It doesn't please God just because you said glory be to God. And here, they did this in the name of God, to the glory of God, and God let them die. He did not protect them because He told them, this is not my will. And so this is a good learning lesson for us into how do we discern the will of God? Well, I have three takeaway points for you from this story. And ultimately, a few words we'll say about this change of covenants, um, about discerning the will of God. The first thing that I can take away from this, and I kind of got maybe ahead of myself here, but just because God said He wanted something yesterday doesn't mean that He wants it today. In Numbers chapter 20, if you were to turn, and we're not going to read this, so you don't have to turn and read it with me. But in Numbers chapter 20, six chapters later, <clears throat> you might be familiar with the story where Moses strikes a rock and water comes out of it. Well, before Numbers chapter 20, way back here in Exodus chapter um, 17, I believe it was, God told Moses, because the people were thirsty, to strike this rock and water would come out of it. And so he did what God told him to do. He struck the rock just like God told him to, water come out of it. Well, then, over here in Numbers chapter 20, now this is a couple of years later, God tells him um, to go to this rock because of the same situation, the people are thirsty, and God tells him to bring forth miraculous water from a rock again. This time he tells him to speak to the rock. He doesn't tell him to strike the rock. Now, it might seem like a small detail, but nonetheless, Moses can hear the word of God. He goes to that rock and he thinks for the, he's going to do what he did the first time, and he strikes that rock. And water comes out of it. But God was upset with him. And because of what Moses did, he did not listen to God. God told Moses, you're not going to enter the land of Canaan. And God forgave him. And from the rest of Scripture, best indications are that Moses is going to be in heaven. He's in the chapter of faith that Etienne talked to us about. But he went against the will of God and that he didn't do what God told him to do. Now, now, he could have reasoned from that. He could have said, well, God, you told me back here in Exodus chapter 17 to strike the rock, and that's what I did. And what would God say to him? You know, I don't know precisely, obviously, but God could tell him, well, guess what? My will can change, and it changed, and I told you it changed. And I don't care what I asked for yesterday. This is what I'm asking for today. And that's similar, really, to what happens in, in uh, <coughs> worship. When we think about worship and the church, a lot of times when I've had conversations with people, uh, you know, different differences in worship will come up. And, you know, worship at, in, in churches has changed a lot over the last, man, even the last 20 years since I was a kid. Um, I guess it was probably being revolutionized 20 years ago. But 50 years ago especially, worship generally, when you go to a church, doesn't look anything like it used to 50 years ago. And... Uh, one of the things that's very distinct about the way that we worship, we try to worship very simply and according to the New Testament scriptures, is that we don't use instrumental music in our worship. And um, we, we have just one cup and one loaf of bread during the Lord's Supper, just like Jesus observed in the uh, upper room with the disciples. We um, take up a, a collection of money for every first day of the week, like Paul told the Corinthians. And we do these things that are different than what they did in the Old Testament. And why is that? Because at the cross, Jesus' death affected a change in the covenants. And so at that point, Paul said that the handwriting of requirements was nailed to the cross, 
And the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about and that the Hebrew writer says has come into effect is the covenant that we go under, live under today. And so somebody will say, well, they used instruments in the Old Testament to worship God. Well, why don't y'all? And just politely, I'll tell them, I'll say, well, because in the New Testament, uh, that's the covenant we live under. And you don't see people worshiping God with instruments in the New Covenant Scriptures, this part of the Bible. You don't see that. You see it in the Old Testament, but you see God's will has changed from yesterday. The Old Testament was yesterday. The New Testament's today. And in the New Testament, God commits His people to sing with their heart and with their voice. And so that's why we do that today. Here's another passage in Colossians chapter 2. And we, we've been referring to verse 14, but I want to read Colossians 2 verse 16. Keep your finger in numbers. But in Colossians 2 verse 16, um, this is a really great passage to, to understand very simply this idea that God's will has changed and certain things that were true under the old covenant are no longer true today. In this chapter, there are people at the church at Colossae who are trying to enforce certain rites and rituals from the law of Moses, but Paul says this, verse 16, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. When he says, let no one judge you in new moons or Sabbaths, he's talking about old covenant holy days. And so if somebody comes along and they're a Judaizing teacher and they tell you, you can't be saved unless you keep the Sabbath. He's saying, listen, don't listen to them. Don't let anybody tell you that anymore because verse 14 says that that ritual, that right, those holy days, all that law was nailed to the cross. That's yesterday's news and we're living today under the law of Christ. And so that we have to think about that when we're talking about why do we do the things that we do. The old covenant was yesterday, the new covenant's today. And so that's the first thing that I would take away from this lesson at Kadesh Barnea, uh, Numbers chapter 13 and 14, is that even in one day, God's will changed. And that was very important for the people to pay attention to. The second thing that we can learn is... Don't presume just because you like something that God must like it too. Sometimes people will allude back to the Old Covenant like we referenced before. And sometimes their point of reference for why they do what they do is not going back to the Old Covenant. It's just simply the fact that this feels right. This, you know, I'm doing this to the glory of God. Uh, why wouldn't God be pleased with this? And so we'll talk about what this word presume means in just a minute. But they presume that God likes something because they like it. Numbers chapter 14. Let's read verses 41 through 43. I don't know if we've read all three of these chapters at this point. So let's, or verses. So let's read verses 41 through 43. This is after they had um, mourned and said, we've sinned. And Moses says, now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies. For the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you will fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Could Moses have been any more clear? <laughs> he said, do not go up. God said, you will die. And they presumed to go up anyway. And the Amalekites and the Canaanites drove him back as far as Hormon, the next verse says. Does that sound like people today? God's word says, do not or do this. And people do the opposite of it anyway. They presume the opposite of the word of God. Of course, God today is not raining down fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. He's not um, shaking a mountain at Mount Sinai. He's not turning the, the sky black like he did on the cross. So we don't see the visual manifestations that they saw, but we can be very confident that the promises of God are sure based off the testimony that we have. And we get sometimes, we get progressive. That's a word to describe evolution of thought and change in behavior. We get very progressive in our thinking, and we think, well, if, if, we're being, if we're getting progressive in our society and we're getting smarter and smarter, God must be too. 
And I realize that God wrote this 2,000 years ago, but God's progressive with the times just like we are, is he not? And so surely God wants women in pastoral roles today, even though that he said in 1 Corinthians 14, I did not permit a woman to speak in the churches. That's a very unpopular statement today, but we don't observe that just because it's unpopular or unpopular. We observe it because that's what God's word says. And surely God wants performance worship or entertainment worship like all the other churches today. Surely, because that's what gets people to come to the, to the worship. And so surely God must want that too because that's what we want. And surely God wants rock bands in worship too. They essentially had rock bands in the Old Testament, didn't they? Uh, so surely God must want that too. And so we get very progressive in our thinking. And Moses told them, he said, do not go up, you will die. I realize people, people have told me this before. I've read them a scripture from 1 Corinthians on women's roles in the churches. And you don't have to be rude about it. You just simply read the word of God and say, this is why we do what we do. And they said, I know the Bible says that, but I don't, I don't do that. Why would they do that? Why would somebody presume to, do, to say something like that? Well, why did the Israelites presume to act the way that they did at Kadesh Barnea? I, I don't know. The word presume there, verse 44, it says this. It's from the Strong's uh, H6075, if you want to look it up. The word presume, according to Brown, Brown uh, Driver and Briggs, says to be heedless. I thought about that. That's not a word that we use today. I figured maybe some of you guys that are still in school today don't know what heedless means anymore. You know, presume. So I looked it up on Oxford Languages, and it says showing a reckless care, or showing a reckless lack of care or attention. So if we read that again, but they showed a reckless lack of care and attention by going up to the mountaintop. I thought of what's this like in common experience? Have you ever had your mom tell you this? I had my mom tell me this before. Didn't you even hear what I said? Were you even listening to a word? Did you see my mouth move? That's what this means. So listen to it again. They presume to go up to the mountaintop. Another way of reading this, but they went up anyway. Another way of reading that is, but they didn't listen. And so don't presume just because you like something that God must like it too. That's a very clear lesson that we learn from this. And lastly, the third thing that we learn is that sincerity does not trump faithfulness. And I didn't know of a better word to use than the word trump. And maybe some of you younger kids don't play spades. But in spades... I'm, you probably don't want to play with me because right now I'm losing track of which is the high card. I think the high card in spades is the queen of spades, is it not? B? Ace. He says it's the ace of spades. And the ace of spades is the most powerful card. And so the ace of spades, if anybody lays that down, that trumps everything else and you win the hand. Did I get that right? Okay. It's been a while since I lost to D at spades. And uh, anyway, sincerity does not trump faithfulness. I want to explain that to you for just a second, and then we'll wrap things up. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 14, verse 39, I want to read this, or at least this phrase from it again. It says that the people mourned greatly. Think about that. It didn't say they cried. You know, to me, and maybe I'm making too much out of this, but mourning is different than crying. Mourning expresses a deep, sincere grief. And they mourned greatly. I don't think for a second that these people were not sincere. In verse 40, they said, Here we are. We'll go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we've sinned. And I don't think it, it took a lot of courage, if you think about it. It took a lot of courage for them to then go in there and defy those giants. Don't think for a second that that did not take courage. Now, they didn't have God on their side, but as far as they knew, God was still going to pick them up, and God let them die anyway. He told them, he warned them, they did it anyway, sincerely, of course. 
I think that's the key to take away from this third point. They did it sincerely. And I think we, we think sometimes that as long as we do something sincerely, it'll be okay. And God will understand. I know what God said, but they're sincere. He'll understand. I'm sincere. God will understand. There's two stories, and we're not going to read them, but if you want to, um, I'm going to put these up here, and I'll give you an easy way to remember these. This is very helpful stories in the Old Testament. I'll tell you how to remember those in just a second. Um, those two stories, in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, there's the story of a guy named Uzzah. And Uzzah, <coughs> I think he acted in all sincerity. What was happening at that story at that time is that David was the king of Israel and he was trying to transport the Ark of the Covenant from the land of the Philistines to, or it had already come from the land of the Philistines, but he's trying to transport it to, I believe it was Bethel, where the tabernacle was. I may have that particular location off. But regardless, they were supposed to carry the Ark by poles, Levites carrying the Ark. And they got innovative and progressive and thought, well, we're going to carry it efficiently by a, a cart with oxen. And as Uzzah the, was driving those oxen, the oxen stumbled, the, car, the cart started to fall, the ark started to fall. He reached out sincerely to grab the, the, the ark of the covenant and God struck him dead. Because no one except a Levite was supposed to touch that ark and they weren't transporting it the way that God told him to do it in the first place. He did it out of all sincerity and he died anyway. And I believe in that story that Uzzah wasn't ignorant. He knew you weren't supposed to touch that ark, and he knew he wasn't a Levite, but he did it anyway. In this story in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, there's, a, there's a, another type of example. They're different, um, but they are similar in a way, in that both of these people presume, Uzzah presumes what, to do what he did. And the second one is King Uzziah. And you can see how their names are similar. So Uzzah. Not the same as Isaiah, who's the king of Israel in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. In that situation, King Isaiah presumed to go himself into the temple and offer sacrifice in the temple, burn incense. Well, nobody was supposed to go into the holy place besides a Levite again. And King Isaiah was of the tribe of Judah. He was not a Levite. And so what happened? The priests go in there and they yank him out of there. And God strikes him with leprosy, and he dies in a hut, isolated, by himself. Both of them presumed the will of God. They presumed that because I'm the king, I can go into that temple and offer incense. And he learned very quickly that God didn't care if he was a king or not. That meant nothing to God, the true king. Uzzah learned, well, it was a quick learning experience. He learned that it doesn't matter if you're sincere or not. If you know the will of God and you go against the will of God anyway, you have no excuse. The difference between sincerity and faithfulness, they're two different things. And this is where we'll end. You can be sincere without being faithful. But you can't be faithful without being sincere. And I think it's important to say that because I think when we... Maybe I start saying things about, you know, maybe it sounds like I'm downplaying sincerity. I'm not, I'm not downplaying sincerity. I'm just simply saying that sincerity by itself is not faithfulness. And there are a lot of people in the world that I believe they are sincerely following God. But the question is, are they faithful? And are they, do they, have they paired faithfulness with their sincerity. Now, I don't think any of us are following God perfectly. I also want, I want to leave that impression. I don't think that anybody in this building is living a perfectly sinless life. I can tell you myself, I have sinned in this last week. And if I stand before God on the day of judgment, I'm going to be at His mercy. And I'm going to be depending on God to save me. I can tell you, at least as far as is within my being, I slept good last night, though. Actually, I had a really good nap this afternoon. Woke myself up snoring. That's how good I slept. 
I didn't have any trouble sleeping though this afternoon because as far as, at least today, as far as I know I, I, that I've read God's word, I've understood his will, and I've done that to the best of my ability, understanding that I do make mistakes and I do need the cleansing blood of Christ. And I've done it in all sincerity. And maybe there is some area that I've failed in, and I'm sure there is, and I'll find it out this week. But I believe and I trust that God will forgive me of my sins as far as I am obeying His will that I understand and I'm doing it with sincerity, both those things together. And God will save me by His grace, I believe. And I believe we should all be confident in our salvation. But we have to understand that these three things, just because God wanted something yesterday doesn't mean He wants it today. God's law has changed from the Old Covenant. And we want to understand what does God want for my life today. Go to the New Covenant. Go to the New Testament. Start reading. Understand it. And do it. Don't presume just because you like something that God must like it too. Again, go to the Word of God. God will tell you what He likes. And number three, sincerity doesn't trump faithfulness. And so, after you find out what God likes by going to His Word, then do it with all sincerity of heart. And God will save us by His grace. That's my lesson tonight. I hope that that can help you and aid you in your understanding of the Scriptures and that this event that happened to Israel doesn't have to be repeated in history. That can, that can be something that we can let have happened to them and, and let's not repeat uh, the same mistake today. Well, if there's anybody here that is subject to the things that we've said and, and maybe it struck a chord with you. Uh, maybe you'd like the prayers of the congregation here and you feel like it would be helpful for you to receive mutual edification from prayer to God. Maybe there's somebody here that has not obeyed the gospel. Um, as I typically do, we'll just quickly go through the steps of salvation. The Bible says in the New Covenant Scriptures that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Um, we have to listen to God's Word and understand what it says. And after we do, we'll understand that uh, we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That means that He is God, come in the flesh to die for our sins, to be crowned the King, the Son of God. John chapter 3, verse 16. We have to repent of our sins. That means have a change of heart, a change of direction, to stop doing what we were doing that was sin, and start doing what we know to do, which is righteousness. We have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Not just believe it, but confess it. That includes a verbal confession, but it also that verbal confession is a vow of allegiance to Jesus Christ. And you're vowing, I'm going to be faithful to Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. And then you're baptized in water for the remission of, this, of sins. And there's nothing in the water that saves you. It's just simply that God has designated the point in time that you're immersed in water as the point in time in which you are baptized uh, into Christ. And He washes your sins away. And that's, baptism was an urgent matter in the Bible. So urgent that Ananias would tell Paul, why are you waiting? Get up from there and be baptized. And the Philippian jailer and his whole household were baptized in the middle of the night, the most inconvenient time of the night, because it was an urgent matter, because it is for remission of sins. And if so, if there's somebody here who's not been baptized for the remission of sins, you've not made this vow of allegiance to Jesus Christ, you need to. You're also welcome to uh, let us know, and we can help you with that. If anyone is of either case, please come forward while we stand while we sing. If you like this sermon, do three things for me. Give it a thumbs up below, click the subscribe button, and share it with a friend either on social media or text. This helps the channel grow. It helps the word get out there. It's something really easy that you can do to affect the spreading of the gospel. This has been the Chapel Grove Church of Christ. Visit our website at chapelgrovechurch.com. We'll see you next time.